welcome to our first video um, that deals with the seven habits of highly successful families. I am Jill McClanahan. I am the multi-classroom leader at Western Guilford Middle School. I am also a mother of two and a grandma of four. And um, my co-partner in hosting is Mr. Paul Sachs. Mr. Paul Sachs? <laughs> Most of you know me as Senior Paul. I teach I Spanish it. here at the middle school and she doesn't look like she's a grandmother four times <laughs> over, that's for sure. And so uh, we're, we're excited to be here with you guys today. And we're looking forward to not just uh, today's session, but the sessions that we're gonna do that will follow this one. So they'll be sequential. We've got uh, seven habits that we wanna cover with you guys, but today we just kinda wanna introduce ourselves, introduce the program, and hopefully uh, you can get to know a little bit about us. Maybe we'll get to know a little bit about you as well. So we're gonna jump right into things today and thank you for being with us. We're looking forward to it. Absolutely. So family is the most important organization in the world. So with that being said, let's just take a moment and talk about that quote for a second. Yeah. You know, families are different. Your family is gonna look different than mine. Yours is gonna look different from mine. And we're not here to define what the perfect family looks like. We're just gonna to try to give a few ideas that might help uh, you know, to improve uh, the dynamics of all of our families. And so that's what we're hoping to do with you guys today. Right, and at the end of the day, the family is the one thing that will always be a constant. So Absolutely. it's important that we nurture it. Yeah, it's the foundation. Everything's built upon it. And we know they come in all shapes and sizes. Each family is unique. And the best person to determine the definition of your family is yourself, is you. No doubt about that. So, your name. Talk about a minute. Talk about that for a minute and tell <laughs> us, what is your greatest strength as a parent? Ooh. I've got a 23-year-old and a 22-year-old. And so, um, I started teaching, you know, when my kids were in elementary school. And I think the greatest strength that I have is just I nurture relationships with my children at home. And then that kind of carries over here because I nurture relationships here at the school with possibly your children and, and the other children in the school because I think um, one of my favorite quotes, and it's been, you know, uh, said that different people said this, but I, I think it was Edward Burke that said, um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's kind of what I deal with my children. So I'd say nurturing would be my strength. What about yours? I love it. I think mine would be transparency. If um, my daughter or my son would ask me a question that I thought could be a little personal, but it helped them along their journey, I would share the truth with them. So I think that being transparent for me is one of mine. Yeah, and I think that's important because, I mean, transparency, especially here with the kids, um, if, if you tell them a little something they didn't quite right, you lose that trust. And think about it, whether it's a family dynamic, whether it's a school dynamic, work dynamic, or even a relationship dynamic, that trust is a key component. So we got to keep that. Good point. Yeah, good. So our first endeavor is going to be talking about building a nurturing family culture. So let's dig a little deeper into that. So what are the three common purposes of a family to you? And I think, I, I think when we see the next few slides, I think that we're going to go, yeah, that's exactly right. So we could, you know, we can sit and reflect on it, but I think, you know, this program does a good job of kind of summing up everything because we always think of mind, body, soul. And so you're, you're thinking about the brain, the heart, and then the spirit. And so these are all kind of a part of this program. So our first activity is to look at those things. Like how do we as a family nurture one another's heart, one another's body, one another's mind, and one another's spirit? What do you think? Well, I wanted to look at them kind of sequentially. So if I'm thinking about, you know, my responsibility as a parent, from the time your children are born, the primary thing that you gotta do is provide for them. You gotta make sure that they have nutrition, you gotta make sure that they're fed, you gotta make sure that they're well taken care of in that physical component. But then, safety. My, my kids, uh, I was just telling Jill a little while ago that my kids think I'm paranoid because they don't realize the way the world truly is because you know they haven't had, had those experiences yet. So when I tell my daughter, I don't want you going to Raleigh by yourself, and she's fighting me on that, she understands that it's her safety that I'm trying to you know, really, really stress, but she wants to you know, exercise that authority. Then the other component of this is that physical exercise and rest. Um, that's something that I've tried to model in my kids' lives. 
I wanted them to see me, you know, eating right, um, exercising and trying to get enough sleep, which is difficult. If you're a parent, you absolutely know this. <laughs> And then, you know, just that shelter component, because it's one that we take for granted so often, but, you know, we have so many kids and so many families who can't take that for granted. And so that first portion right there as a parent, it sometimes it's very difficult to provide all those things because we wear so many hats. So that was, you know, that's the body part of it. What do you think about the heart? I think the nurturing the heart is huge. Um, modeling how to love one another even when our kids may seem most unlovable and i'm speaking from experience it's not easy and when you're raising adolescents for sure we're talking about middle school kids they're really um trying to find their space and saying yes and no to things and mostly no so um demonstrating and modeling that love and acceptance and teaching kids how to um, find value in who they are and build in that confidence, um, you know, pushing them to to go beyond and push themselves a little further, Absolutely. that there's nothing wrong with that. We know that growth comes in challenges. So, um, and, and showing them, I, mean, I understand you, I hear you, and may not, your thinking may not be completely right yet, but I understand where you're coming from. I was a kid, I was a kid once too. It's hard for them to believe that. I know. It is. Oh, it no. is. I mean, they're, we're so old. Like, you were right? young at one time? <laughs> yeah, I didn't always have all this gray. <laughs> no, um, me either. <laughs> but, you know, it's a great segue into the mind. Yeah. Because, you know, oftentimes people think that it's solely the job of teachers to teach. We all know that's not right. It, as a parent, we know that we have the greater responsibility. Sure, we may not teach our kids calculus. We may not teach them the things that they're going to learn that may further their career. Um, or we might. But when you think about it, knowledge, um, knowledge and wisdom are completely different. Knowledge means that I know something. Wisdom means that I apply it in a way that is beneficial to myself and to others. And so, you know, there's that progress. We go from, from that knowledge to realizing, hey, you know what? I do need this. This is important, which, you know, um, in our climate today, you know, post-COVID or I guess in, in coming out of COVID, so many kids, you know, they, they face so many challenges. And when I think about the learning over the last couple of years, it's been very difficult for those students to learn. It's been very difficult, I know, from our perspective to teach. And then parents, I understand what you've been going through because I have children of my own at home. And I know the challenges, especially with my son in medical school, and I'm trying to help him when he's doing a class that's remote, and I have no idea what's being taught. And so I have to entrust you know, his learning to those professors. But then there's that side of it that says, he says, well, dad, I'm not going to tune into that Zoom call today. And I'm like, yes, you are. Or my son looked at me just recently and he said, I think I'm just going to withdraw from this class. He said, I'd rather do that than get a B. And I was like, uh, but if you withdraw from the class, I lose a thousand dollars. And so that's not what we do. So step it up, uh, get off the video game for a while at 23. You can afford to do that all right. and, you know, put more time into studying. So, um, we've had to be very creative as teachers. I know as parents, you've had to be very creative in helping your children and your students to learn. And so that component, that mind component um, right now is basically kind of like a double-edged sword, if you will, because we want them to learn, but we also understand that the mind has been impacted in such a way because of the lack of socialism that we've had you know, socializing right. with, with other students and with um, maybe even the adults in the classroom that now that we're hopefully turning that corner on the um, COVID and the remote learning and things, I think this is gonna be one of the key areas that we are really going to just covet uh, your support. And, and even more so than that, um, be supportive to you as you try to, you know, develop our children's minds. Absolutely, and then just the modeling of these things for our kids, because they're so, um, they're like little sponges and they absorb so much, but will help provide meaning to all of these parts, like why I need to take care of myself, or why it's good to feel good about myself, or why I should challenge myself, and help them to contribute to others' growth in that way too. And when we see the service and the vision here, like how are they, providing support in those areas to other their peers or to their siblings and then um, leaving that legacy um, that 
as a family, we hope like one day that our kids carry on when we're not here anymore. Um, so anyway, I, th I love this. I love this whole perspective here. Um, so this effective families create a nurturing family culture that satisfies four basic needs, the body, heart, mind, and spirit. So and we can and each that. one is equally important. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. I mean, if you look at them, you know, if you get that bind, the, the mind, the body, and, you know, the spirit, if every, and the heart, if everything is working together, you're probably going to leave a lasting legacy. That's true. And so, I, I mean, it has to be nurtured. So I know you touched on COVID and all the things. I mean, the past couple of years, we I think everyone's faced nothing but challenges. So this should be a fairly <laughs> easy one to cover. What common challenges do families face in today's world? And I copied down a couple of things I thought. Um, I think that especially when as a middle school teacher and um, my grandkids are 11 and 12, so I see a lot of the influence of social media on their lives and the um, time. Um, one thing that we'll do in our family is like drop the phone when it's dinner time. Like Absolutely. you can't bring it to the dinner table. Um, we don't always do that and um, we'll get called out for it if we do. <laughs> but um, just being an adolescent, like just figuring out where your, your space is and how you function among your friends and your family too, because you're going through so many different emotions. So what do you think? Well, you know, we were talking about, you know, the COVID a little bit, you know, as far as the challenge that we had there. And, and your challenges are probably different than my challenges, you know, depending on the ages of your children, how many children you have, you know, the work situation. I think for, for me, time um, has been extremely difficult. Um, I pastor a church. I teach middle school. I have my own business and I have, you know, responsibilities as a husband. Um, my mom's had some health issues in the last you know, year or so and had to have some surgeries. I had uh, three surgeries or four surgeries last year. And so time and just scheduling, you know, time to be there for my kids has been a challenge. But um, I've made it a priority. You know, even if I lose a little bit of sleep, you know, and that does take away from that component, you know, of the rest. But the thing is, I have to sometimes prioritize what's more important. You know, me getting an extra hour of sleep on me spending that time with my wife or with my children to try to help them where they are. Because, you know, going through college is a difficult time. Just mm -hmm. like going through middle school or high school or elementary school is difficult. Right. Just, yeah, that is totally difficult. So time, management is, <laughs> time management is a challenge for it me. It is huge. For me. So thinking about that and the challenges and how we face them, sometimes our habits and what we repeatedly do can feed into those challenges Ooh. as well. <laughs> so, um, Covey's seven habits of highly affected people are ordered in such a way that as we learn to use those habits, um, they can help us. But we want to know why are they ordered the way they are? And I think the next video we have will help explain that a little bit. I'm going to step aside. To achieve the lasting effectiveness, we go through a natural process of development symbolized by the maturity continuum. Dependence is the lowest level of maturity. When we are dependent, we need others to take care of us, to come through for us, to give us our sense of worth and security. Dependence is the attitude of you. I need you to take care of me. The first three habits help us move from dependence to independence, which is a higher level of maturity. Habit one, be proactive means that we develop our own power to choose our actions and accept responsibility for our choices. Habit two, begin with the end in mind, means that we define the kind of life we want to lead. It's creating clear objectives and laying out a vision or blueprint for what matters most to us and who we want to be. Habit three, put first things first, is where we plan and accomplish our goals so that our lives reflect the vision we have for ourselves. Learning and regularly practicing these first three habits helps us to win the victory over self, attaining what we call the private victory. Where dependence is the attitude of you, you are responsible for me. Independence is the attitude of I. I am responsible for myself. I can choose my future and make it happen. To be highly effective, there is another level of maturity, interdependence which is the attitude of we. It's where we work together creatively with others to achieve far more than any one of us could accomplish on our own. 
Achieving interdependence is the goal of habits four through six. Habit four, think win-win, is the attitude of seeking mutual benefit in our relationships and interactions with others. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, is the ability to truly listen to others, to understand and honor their perspectives and realities. It also means to communicate our own views in a way that is both open and respectful. Habit six, Synergize is the process of working with others in a collaborative and creative way to achieve new and better results. When we think and act interdependently, we win what is called the public victory. Without sufficient independence, people will not have the character and self-mastery to work interdependently with others. That is why habits one, two, and three come before habits four, five, and six. They focus on self-mastery, on developing the strength of our own character. Private victories precede public victories. Habit seven, sharpen the saw, surrounds all the other habits and is the habit of renewal. It's the habit that gives us the power to consistently carry out the other habits in our lives. It's a pattern of daily private victories that creates an upward spiral of increasing effectiveness that lifts up to new and more rewarding levels of understanding and living. You know, the one thing I think when I look at the habits, and we've been dealing with habits now for years, and it's something that, uh, you know, Jill and I are familiar with, but when you're sitting there watching that um, at home or wherever you might be right now, think about this, those habits, a lot of those are things that we already do. We may not call it being proactive. We may call it planning. Mm -hmm. But think about this. We, we probably all have a list of things on the refrigerator or somewhere in the house of things that we need to do. And we do that because it reminds us of what's important. The thing about having the seven habits around is that it reminds us of the things that are important as far as building you know, that uh, family dynamic and nurturing those you know, habits that can make us a highly effective family. I, and I feel like too, like working with the kids coming back from um, the pandemic and they're on campus and stuff, I feel like we're doing a whole lot of work right in this dependence area. Um, and it's of no, any, no fault of anyone, but we, that's where I feel like we are on all grades right now. Exactly. So if we're doing work right in here, we're working toward the independence part. But our big, big goal is to get there where they're working together and they're thinking win-win and learning how to understand and then be understood. Yeah. I, think I think it's, it's really it's challenging. It is. Because I think once you get up in the habits, especially four, mm -hmm. that's a different way of thinking because we're competitive. You right. Know? And so we don't, we don't think win-win. We think if I win, you have to lose. And, and it's a different way of thinking because we can all win. Mm -hmm. you know, and it, things can be beneficial for everybody. Really good point. All right, I love this. It lists the, um, so we're gonna talk about how we feel about these, but over here if you look, you have all your habits listed in order. And then you have family culture two, which is in green, that's where we're headed. But family culture one is pro might be where a lot of us are. And I know when I looked at it, I was like, oh, I see, I can write my name all over on this side. <laughs> so what do you think about this? Where should we start? Well, you know, when you, when you look at these, I think these change, maybe from year to year. It's kind of like this. Um, if I had gotten married at 18, I don't know. I just celebrated my 29th wedding anniversary. I don't know that I would have ever gotten there. My wife probably put, put me out to pasture a long time ago. <laughs> because the things that I wanted at 18 changed at 21 and changed again. And then by the time at 26, when we finally did get married, everything I wanted was right there. And that really hasn't changed all that much. I think with a lot of these, I think the way that um, I use these habits has changed throughout the years. For me, looking at the very first one, uh, as a young person, I was very reactive in everything. Uh, didn't make plans, you know, uh, I would set goals, but if I accomplished them fine, I didn't track those goals. Um, it, it just didn't matter to me. But then as I got older and I had my children and I had a wife now and I had more responsibilities, I started making those plans, I started tracking those goals. You know, there were certain things that I knew that we had to do. You know, for instance, I wanted my kids to go to college. So there were certain things that I had to plan to make sure that happened. You know, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I could retire in about another five years. <laughs> and so I had to put things in line to make that happen. So I became more proactive. I think that's true. And it, we do change over time. And some of these places, I'm still, 
I'm still working. We've been doing the habits here for what, like five years? At least. And there's still some areas I have a long way to go in, I think. <laughs> Um, so this gives us a chance to kind of look and see on a gradient, like where we stand. I'm going to fill mine in. We're going we're to fill ours in. So if you if you've uh, kind of got a way to do this at home, you might want to do this. So I'm, I'm going to say that I'm going to put P right here because I'm, I'm more this way on habit number one for sure. I'm with, I think I'm there. So you with me? Like cool. I'm near. Yeah. Cool. I'm near that. All right. Um, here, I think over here too. Yep, I'm definitely here, and mm -hmm. and this is no matter what I'm doing because I have my own business as as an uh, electrician, and so you have to begin with the end in mind if you're going to be in business. You just have to do that. And we have a grandkid who's really sick, and our focus has been on family. So I'm I'm going to say that we've been very family oriented for a while. I've had so much pull in the last year. You know, my mom, and I know that that's family, but I'm thinking right now about, you know, that, that family that's within the same four walls that I'm in. So I've had to really put a lot of emphasis on my mom. And then at my church, we had lots of deaths and lots of illnesses from COVID. So I would have to say that I was here, but in the last two years, I'd have to say that I've moved more towards probably this way and then kind of centralized it over the last maybe five months or so. I'm a coach like <laughs> instructional and volleyball. So this right here is hard for me because I feel like I'm always competing. So I <laughs> I'm gonna put muscle here. <laughs> I'm with you. I don't want to think win win no, so I'm, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. So I just think <laughs> lose lose all the, time. <laughs> all the time. All the time. This right here has been, I think for me in a leadership position is that is realizing I don't always have to talk. I don't always have to know it. I need to listen more. And so I've found myself shutting my mouth a little bit more, but I still struggle here. So I'm gonna put myself like right about there. I'm gonna join you right there. And I think <laughs> probably I would have been here before mm -hmm. we started studying the leader and me principles and the habits, and I think it's moved me there. Right, and even with, um, if we think about my family, I still need to listen. Cause sometimes, because I, I feel like I know my kids, I raised you, I know better than you do, but that's not the case. I really need to listen to what they're telling me. That word that just jumped off the board at me when you pointed to it, because I thought to myself, how often when I'm talking to my wife, do I pretend to listen? She's telling me about her day at work and I'm thinking, well, I've got a thousand other things going on in my mind. I really can't, don't have time. So I'm looking at her and I'm shaking my head, but if she asked me to repeat what she just said, I'd be lost. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's sad. So yeah, listening to each other is so huge. Communications. It listening first, um, maximizing people's strengths and focusing on or minimizing. Sorry about that. People's strengths and focusing on what weaknesses. I think that um, I'd probably be like right about here. I need to value other people's strengths more. <laughs> I feel like I'm always like seeing people as better than me. Like I'm, I'm working toward that here's, all the time. Here's my problem. <laughs> and, and I'm glad that you're here. But my problem is I'm the kind of guy that I'm like, if you want a job done right, do it yourself. <laughs> and instead of relying on other people's strengths, I'm like, by the time I explain it, I can do it myself. But then, like my son, he said, Dad, teach me how to change the oil. And I'm like, but I can do it faster than I can teach you. And then he said, but if you teach me how to do it, you won't have to do four right. cars. And I was like... Who's the dad? You know, uh, uh, right. Who, uh, and that's go, that goes back to there. So you can yeah. probably move it a little bit more. <laughs> and living a balanced life, I feel like I'm trying harder to work out more and take care of myself or spend time with friends. So I'm going to put my, I still need to work on that a little bit though. Yeah, I'm, I'm working back to this direction. Um, I, I was here most of my life and then kind of shifted back here where it was a little unbalanced. And I think I'm working my way back towards Sharp and Soft because for me, uh, exercise and things like that have always been really important to me. And then, you know, the past year with the surgeries and things, uh, doctor said no working out for a year and I kind of fell out of it. Now I'm trying to get back on the wagon, you know. Right. So. And if you're at home and you've signed up for this course, this is probably in a packet that you have and you can just do this activity at home with your family and have some fun with it. All right, I'm going to erase this so that our initials won't be all over the screen as we move forward. Yeah, can you get that one? Cool. All right, synergy. Absolutely, and you can't recognize another strength. <laughs> That's right. I can erase a board. All right, so something that we have learned from the seven habits is that if you apply even one of them, you can see immediate results, but it's a lifetime adventure. So that means that um, you may be working on it. You might go forward, take some steps back, 
but it's always a learning process. And I think it's important to, to realize, and sometimes when you look at this, you may think, oh my goodness, that's a lot to learn all at once. With that, we're not asking to learn it all at once. We're not even asking you necessarily to learn it. We're just hoping that you'll put it into practice uh, just a little bit at a time. And we'll be doing this, you know, it'll be over several weeks and you can always go back and rewatch anything that you want to rewatch. Good point. All right, so, ooh, here we go, paradigms. Why are paradigms so powerful in our lives? And we're gonna watch this video. So much of what we do in our personal lives and at the office is the result of the paradigms we hold. And what we do, in turn, affects the results we get. Thanks for coming to the meeting today, everyone. The word paradigm comes from the Greek root paradigma, meaning pattern. The pattern we expect to see, or the mental image of the way things are. We see everything through the perspective of our own paradigm. What we see, our paradigms, determine what we do, which in turn determines what we get. And unless we consciously stand apart from and examine our paradigms, we might never see that perhaps many of them are distorted, short-sighted, or just flat out wrong. I remember a many paradigm shift I experienced one Sunday morning on the subway in New York City. People were sitting very quietly, some reading, some resting with their eyes closed. Suddenly, a man and his children entered the subway car. The children ran yelling to the car, throwing things, grabbing people's newspapers. Their father sat down near me and closed his eyes and did nothing. I felt irritated. I could not believe he would let his children run wild like that. After a few minutes of patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you could control them just a little more. Yeah, you're right. I should do something. But we just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago, and I guess they don't know how to handle it. Guess I don't know how to handle it. Can you imagine how I felt at that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly I saw things differently. And because I saw differently, I thought differently. I felt differently. I acted differently. My irritation vanished. Compassion flowed freely. I wanted to help instead of criticizing and complaining. Once you see things as they really are, you'll think, feel, and act differently. And you'll do it automatically, spontaneously. If you want to make minor changes in your life, work on your behavior. But if you want to make significant Quantum breakthroughs. Work on your paradigms. Paradigms. Powerful. I mean, if you think about it, it's just perspective. It's how we see things. And we think that what we see in our little world is the world. An example, I'll tell the kids today, when I was in school, I graduated in 85, they didn't really teach science like they do today. So I was one who believed that if it was snowing here, it was snowing in China, and it was snowing in Russia, and it was snowing in Europe, and it was snowing everywhere in South America, because there wasn't that you know um, level of teaching that said, hey, this is important for me to know about different cultures, different regions. And so one day when I realized, you know, it's not daylight in the whole world, it's not raining in the whole world, it was like, oh my goodness. It opened up a new world to me and you know did was it earth shaking or anything like that no but for me it was kind of a wake-up thing and i've had a lot of those in my life me too 
I agree with that. And that's the like paradigm shifts are extremely powerful. Life changing. They are. Um, so how to change a habit. So paradigms are we look at the principles of effectiveness and the reliability of how what we see and what we do leads to what we get. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, uh, his example, uh, Dr. Covey's example was a really good one because I've seen, I guess we've all seen situations like that where we're, we're at Walmart or we're at, you know, Harris Teeter and there's this kid that's just running all over the place and, you know, our paradigm is our kids go to the store, they stand beside the buggy or they sit in the buggy or they are there with us and they're acting the way that we believe that they should act. But if it's a different culture, if it's a different family culture, and if there's a traumatic experience that kind of unsettles everything, we don't see that. So what we see is what sets our paradigm. I think, you know, which leads us to what we do, like with him, you know, can you take care of your kids? And then of course, when we see the other person's perspective, it changes what we do. Because he said that grace began to flow and that mm -hmm. compassion began to rise up in him. And in the end, you know, at first, because his paradigm was this man needs to take care of his children, frustration was his result. But then by the time he talked it through with this guy, the result was that he, you know, that he had sympathy for this man. And, and then I'm sure it changed his life. Good point. So to, I love the quote, to make minor changes in your life, you need to work on changing your behavior. But for significant quantum breakthroughs, work on changing your paradigms. So what do you see here? Now, I, when I see it on camera, I see <laughs> what I didn't see before. I do too. Yeah, I, first I saw a guy with a saxophone. But it's actually a pretty lady's face. It is. Oh, is that you, Jill? Hairdo. No, that's not me. Sure. <laughs> Positive. <laughs> but the, it's interesting how we can see things differently, completely differently. It, it really is. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at um, situations like this within our family, like whose paradigms are correct? Um, because we all see them from a different perspective. Like this one gets me like what clean means. I'm sorry, like, um, just picking up the nasty socks off of the floor was not enough. You need to clean the bathroom, too, very well, but... Yeah, because at my nice. house, my mom, make your bed. Mm -hmm. You know, my perspective was, I'm just going to get back in it. Yeah, why, why make, make it? it? If, if we're not putting new sheets on, why do I need to make it? And basically, it came down to, and, and you may have it this way in your home, but my mom <laughs> said... Because I told you to, right? Right. And I was like, that's <laughs> that was, not a good enough reason. <laughs> yeah, but it was. <laughs> then, right? So when have you experienced a paradigm shift? I know for me, a par paradigm shift came when I learned um, that I'm not the one who knows everything in a classroom. And I can learn so much from the kids. And we have so many cultures oh. in our classroom that um, I've learned I've learned new ways to write things, new ways to say things, um, new ways to perceive things. So I've learned so much from students. It took me a little while to get there because I thought that as a teacher I had to know everything, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice, but then again, we'd be a know-it-all. Yeah, and that's nobody right. Would really like <laughs> I think for me, um, one of the greatest paradigm shifts was just observing other teachers. Because I came in and I thought that my way of teaching was the best way of teaching. And then I would go in and I would watch other teachers teach and I thought, wow, that's amazing. Right. Or just the way, like, if, if you could see the room right now, how it's organized and the way it looks, it's very welcoming, very, um, it just puts your mind at ease. And I'm thinking, you know, when the kids come in my classroom, they see pretty much a traditional 1985 classroom <laughs> that I grew up in. And, and you know, um, there are a lot of changes that I've made over the years that um, I thought, you know, this was the way I'm going to teach forever, but it changes every year. Like you said, I reflect and I make changes. And it's really, I mean, reflection is a huge part of that, it like in, in the learning process. So um, our principles centered living, the principles of effectiveness we've covered. So they are self-evident natural laws. They don't change. They're like a compass and they provide a true north direction for our lives. So I think that is um, huge. And I think if you were to go back and paraphrase each one of the habits, there's probably something that you do that would fall right into that particular category from habits one through seven. You know, yeah. because if you go, think about it, if you think about sharpening the saw, if you've got a gym membership that you're using, then 
you're shopping in the saw, or if you take time to read, or you know, maybe you binge watch a TV show like my wife loves to do. You know, or that's... visit a, visit the beach. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Sharpen that saw, right? <laughs> Any of those. All right, so our activity here is taking a look at the habits and which one of these I think um, are part of our lives yeah. right now. So um, just, we'll just take a minute and look through here and you guys can do that too. We were talking earlier today and I told Jill probably in that first one right there, the being proactive, I think responsibility would be the one that really showed up at my house the most because um, with two kids that are um, and either in college or just getting out of college, you know, that's what I keep telling them. I say, guys, you need to be responsible for, you know, taking care of your car. You need to be responsible for taking care of your bank account, your credit cards and all these things. And it's something that we've tried to model, you know, as they were growing up and they've really transitioned into that role of being a responsible adult quite well. And, you know, probably some of it was on purpose and intentional. Others, you know, components were probably accidental. Right. And then something that um, I know our, we have a little book that we're going by and we're looking at. One of the activities was to take the opposite of these words and see what that would be like if we were living like mm. that. So when I look at proactive, I see choice, responsibility, and initiative. But what if I weren't... A, weren't choosing though, if I didn't have choice or if I didn't have responsibility or initiative, what would that be like for me? You'd be a child again. Right. I mean, a little child. You'd be in the dependence stage. Exactly. But these are, um, and this one too, this is where I feel like I'm constantly working. Finding mutual understanding, empathy, and respect. Yeah, because so, we, we hear the opposite of this word a lot, apathy. Right. You know, and, and that's one of the things, that's one of the dangers with our children today. That's one thing I heard in my professional development today is the students are so apathetic, so apathetic, so apathetic. And a lot of teachers are very apathetic. And, you know, we're just, we don't care. You know, kids, well, uh, if you don't do your homework, I can't give you a good grade. I don't care. Right. You know, and the teacher's like, well, if you don't care, I don't care. And then all of a sudden, that's a vicious cycle that that's a lose-lose situation. So, yeah, so trying to develop empathy, you know, putting ourselves in someone else's shoes and respecting their point of view is important. And that's where paradigms change. Exactly. So we're going to hand this off to you as a homework um, assignment. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to turn it in. It's just fun for you to you do You better it. do it. We'll tell your kids. <laughs> I know, right? But what are your reflections on this video today? Um, what's one thing that you think that you could do a practice or a habit that maybe you could put in action and as we move forward we're going to go and dive deeper into each of the seven habits absolutely absolutely is there anything you'd like to add on reflections well i've enjoyed working with this <laughs> lovely lady today and thank you for welcoming us into your home and we really hope that you'll benefit from this i know we are we're going to benefit from it and and ultimately you know they say it takes a village and so we're a tiny part of that village and so um thank you for allowing us uh, just to share a little bit of our time with you in your home we thank you and have a great afternoon see you guys